Alright guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hopefully you all had a really good lunch. Um, so, Dan kind of led our morning session. He talked us through, I think, the first three of the OWASP top 10. So you guys learned a little bit about injection flaws, uh, some of the authentication session management stuff, and then uh, we learned about cross-site scripting. Uh, before we get started on number four, uh, in secure direct object reference, do you guys have any questions? Any questions I can help answer? Things that were percolating over lunchtime? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Um, so, for reflexes, cross site or cross site? It says that, uh, I'm assuming it's a downward trend for a browser interest, because the phone browser and stuff like that, try to try when you fish a, say, customer or, or organization. So what, what's, what's trending or what's new now for the case of place of the JavaScript pass? Um, you know, like not plugins that don't execute JavaScript and stuff like that. In terms of phishing attacks? Oh, or? yeah, phishing attacks or trying to, when you're trying to get into the organization and, and trying to do some type of, yeah, phishing attacks. Okay. So uh, the question for everybody is, What's the new thing? Uh, Cross-site scripting is old school. Uh, nobody does it anymore, which is true. Um, and then, uh, what's the new thing that fish, uh, phishing people are trying to use to compromise victims? Um, so, reflect cross-site scripting still is very much an issue. Um, the thing with reflecting cross-site scripting is you're limiting the trust the user has in the website. So, if I have reflected cross-site scripting on www.ni.com, People trust NI.com and they trust us to deliver content. And you know, cross-site scripting spans SSL certificates, so it might even be HTTPS and have a whole lock and all that stuff. Um, reflected cross-site scripting is just a way for an attacker to get their code into your web page, right? It's a delivery mechanism. And as we'll see later on, um, there are additional attacks like cross-site request forgery, which can be uh, also exploited as a result of having cross-site scripting. So it's kind of a gateway into different types of apps. That said, um, you know, my team runs security for national instruments. And one of the, the kinds of things that we're seeing a lot today, we don't see a lot of cross-site scripting, but that might just be because it's a user-side attack, right? So you might see a reflected cross-site scripting if you were looking at your logs and you're monitoring all the, the uh, parameters that are going through there. If you're running a web application firewall, you know, there's a lot of things that have to happen from a monitoring standpoint to even see that cross-site scripting is happening. Um, whereas uh, typical phishing attacks that we do see are usually leveraging things like, hey, here's this file, and you should open this because it contains a version, right? And that's a um, Java, uh, like a Adobe PDF file that's JavaScript embedded in it. Um, we'll see that kind of stuff. Or it might just be a uh, HTML file, and that HTML file will be open it. It's like log in here to access you know, this file via O365 or something like that. And so we'll enter the username and password to submit, and that goes off to the attacker somewhere. So we're actually, uh, in our case, we're seeing kind of a dummy now with some of these attacks where it's like, hey, let's try to figure out the most simple way to get out of the people. And it's almost like low hanging fruit, right? You don't expect somebody like me to fall for, you know, open this HTML file and enter your username and password, but there's lots of people out there who just don't know enough about security, and they will double click that. They will enter their credentials. So I think that we're seeing a lot of almost simple patient getting attacks based, especially with phishing is concerned. Um, and I think a lot of that is in response to things like Mother um, Eye, like Proofpoint. You've got all these big technologies where they'll sandbox things and look for that kind of activity. Um, they'll scan URLs to see is there something malicious on the site that's going to. Um, and so the attackers are having to figure out you know, what, how do I bypass these things? And the answer is, well, if I just include an HTML page, like, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That happens all the time. Um, and so those are the kind of things that we're seeing kind of sense. Okay, other questions? Cool. All right, so we're going to talk about insecure direct object reference. Oh, uh, real quick, how many of you guys are actually attending the conference after this? All right, so pay close attention to 
of this. Um, I do every year, I do what's called the last come badge game. And so on the back side of your badge, you'll see like a code and whatnot. Mm -hmm. If you can figure out that code, there's about a five stage uh, game, if you will. And the game leverages a, a few different types of attacks, um, leverages just some cryptography stuff. Um, and at the end of it, uh, if you guys can complete the competition, you get one of these. This is an official LastCon 2017 challenge coin. And uh, if you spend the time, you get rewarded with one of these bad puppies. So um, if you're attending the conference, hopefully you get a chance to participate in the game. If you're struggling, let me know. Um, but pay close attention to this next section because it might uh, have something to do with the game. All right, so what is this guy? This occurs when a developer exposes a reference to an internal implementation object, like a file, a directory, or a database key. And they don't perform an access control check, and they don't perform any other sort of protection. And as a result of that, the attackers can manipulate references to access other bits of data. The impact here is going to be moderate because these flaws can compromise all the data that can be referenced by the parameter. So if, for example, you have a uh, file equals and then some web page parameter. And as a result of that, you're loading that content into the page of the website. And I can say, well, instead of that file, I want to go to Etsy password and grab the contents of Etsy password. Now I've just exposed all the users on that system. I know all the users that exist on that server, right? So the idea is, based on what the content is, based on what this parameter is exposing, we can get additional data from the system. Um, unless object references are unpredictable, it's pretty easy for an attacker to access all this data at that time. So unpredictable meaning it's a random value, right? We're using like with uh, some random uh, value in order to reference that. But if it's sequential, then we have problems. And so when we're trying to consider the impact to our actual application, we want to look at the exposed data as well as the impact to exposure. So is this just an internal site? Is it a publicly available site? What data is being exposed? Those kind of things. So here's an example. In the first case, we have a valid use case of this application. We have a database. That database has a list of keys. And we have a view statement on ASPX, so it's an ASP application. And then we're passing in a statement ID parameter. And in this case, that statement ID parameter is parameter 3. Now, we can see that this particular user has access to statements 1 through 12. And I guess in this case, 1 through 12 is like associated with his user ID. His user ID has access to those statements. And so when he says, I want to view statement 3, the application says, all right, cool, here's statement three. But the application doesn't perform any sort of check to make sure that he's uh, authorized to access these statements. And so it's just a matter of the application is representing, here's the things that you can see, not necessarily the things that you have access to. And the result of this is an attacker who may or may not have access to this stuff. Like in this case, he has access to one through 12 as well. He says, all right, well, what happens if I get statement 17? And all of a sudden, the database comes back with, here's statement 17, right? And he said, well, I only had access to 1 through 12. So because we know that these are sequential numbers, we can provide in a different value, and we can get back the data for that particular value. Make sense? Cool. So how do we test applications for this? Well. Um, this can be hard to automate because automated scanners really are request and response based. Feed some data in, get the response back, and if the response is something that is weird, then you know that that's a problem. But if in this case I'm feeding in a file name or a ID parameter, I don't know what that response should look like. So how does a scanning tool know the difference between statement ID 3 and statement ID 17? The answer is it doesn't, right? So we need to test this manually. And the way that we test this manually is we look at the parameters that are being passed to our application, and then we manipulate them. We feed in random bits of data, or maybe sequential numbers that are outside of the order that we're seeing, things like that. 
And we've looked at the pages whose only purpose is to display information about a single object. So some common examples here are going to be things like documents, or accounts, or states. Things where if I pass in a particular value, I expect to get one of those things back. In terms of automating this exploitation, it's actually really easy. Because if it's a sequential number, then all I have to do is write a quick script that says, start with this number, iterate through each of these uh, numbers up to whatever value, and tell me whether it's successful or not. So as an attacker, I might write something like this. This basically says, keep looping forever. Start with a value of zero, so we're getting a server or script uh, t equals zero, and then you can test that anyway. And then increment i, so i becomes one, and then do it again. And then increment i, so it's two, and then do it again. So very quickly, we can iterate through a lot of different values. We're basically limited by how fast our computers make these requests, and how fast the server is at responding to those requests. And if that server has no great limitation on it, and it's not doing anything to control it, am I supposed to have access to these values or not, you can actually iterate through these things very, very quickly. Um, inside of WebGo, so Dan showed you guys a little bit of WebGo earlier, and I mentioned that's something that I use when I'm training developers. Um, there's a access control flaws, and there's something called bypass, a path-based access control scheme. It's a really good exercise here to help you with this particular issue because it shows you how you can specify different things in order to get around these access control mechanisms where it's only based on the path value. To mitigate against this, you don't want to expose internal keys or identifiers. That's going to be the first thing. Because if you expose those internal keys or identifiers, then somebody on the outside knows what you're doing on the inside. Right? You want to use object references that are challenging to guess. And that's why I mentioned earlier using a GUID. Because a GUID is a random value. It's not a sequential value. And so by referencing something as a random value, there's no way for you to write that script that I showed you guys. There's no way to just iterate through different values unless if you're truly iterating through all the possible values. And that's just brute force, right? You're just going through some really, really long number hoping that you might land on something that's valuable. Probably not going to happen. The real solution for this, though, is to perform server-side authorization checks when somebody accesses an object. So in this case, with that the statement ID equals, right, we want to say this particular user has access to these particular objects. So that user should only have access to object 1 through 12. And if somebody comes and says, I want access to statement 17, it should say, no, you're not authorized for statement 17. You have access to 1 through 12. And when they go and they say, no, no, I want statement 17 again, you say, no, you only get 1 through 12. Right? So that's how we control the access here and how we make sure that users are able to access those things. Questions about that? All right. So the recap here is that insecure direct object references occur when an application exposes those internal references to objects via the parameters that are passed to our application. And by manipulating those, those parameters, we're able to get data that we're not authorized to access. And to prevent this, we don't expose internal keys or identifiers for objects. We use references that are challenging to guess, like those WIDs, those random values. And we perform our server-side authorization to make sure that those users are capable of accessing those particular objects. Cool. All right. So lots of references here. Um, the OWASP top 10 has a section on insecure direct object references. Uh, and I don't think Dave mentioned this, but OWASP has the OWASP top 10, which is effectively that high-level guidance. And then OWASP also has what's called cheat sheets. And cheat sheets are great ways for you guys to learn things really, really quickly. So if you look at a OWASP cheat sheet, it's going to tell you what the problem is, and it's going to give you an example of that problem. So you're going to see how it works, maybe some code as to how that particular thing might function. And then it's going to tell you, here's all the things that you need to do to fix it. 
which makes it really easy for us as uh, developers to go and say, hey, you know, somebody told me about this cross-site scripting, and I should look up OWASP XSS cheat sheet into Google, and there I go. And it's got all the information that you need there. The other thing that I don't think Dan touched on was the SAPI. The SAPI stands for Enterprise Security API. The SAPI is an OWASP project, and there's the SAPI versions for pretty much any language that you're looking at using, where a SAPI is really, it gives you kind of a framework for how to do certain types of actions, um, certain types of requests, everything from crypto to passwords to you know everything in between. And personally, I don't like uh, using a SAPI as a framework because um, I don't think it's a very strong framework in that sense. But the code in a SAPI is usually pretty good. It's fairly well vetted. And so if you're looking at how, in Java, how do I uh, accomplish this particular feat, you may want to look up OWASP Asapi and say, how did they do it there? And use that as an example when you're building your application to build it. All right, so moving on. Next one in our OWASP top 10 is security misconfiguration. Um, and what you're going to find here is that the first couple, first two, three things um, that we talk about in the OWASP top 10, we spent a lot of time on those two like all morning, right, on like two things plus the, the security basics. These last ones fly pretty quickly. So security misconfiguration is good security requires having a secure configuration defined and deployed for our application, for our frameworks, for our servers, for our web servers, our database, our entire platform, right? And security settings should be defined, implemented, and maintained because the defaults are often insecure. And frankly, in a lot of cases, that's intentional. Uh, I mentioned earlier that I wrote an application called Simplers. And the default username for Simplers is admin, and the default password for Simplers is admin. And it might as well be changed, right? Because it's intentionally set to something insecure. Because I expect whoever's using the application to go and say, okay, well, admin's not a good password, especially when the username's admin, and I should go ahead and change that. And if you didn't, this is what you got. The other piece here is software needs to be kept up to date. Because old versions of software tend to have uh, bugs, which is usually why people update it, but it also has security vulnerabilities. And so you take uh, Equifax. You guys hear about Equifax, largest <laughs> PII data breach in history, right? Um, the problem with Equifax was a struts vulnerability. And for those who don't know, Apache struts, very common web framework, lots of uh, applications use it. In fact, National Instruments had Apache struts, actually the vulnerable version, on our website several months leading uh, before the Equifax breach. And my team detected it out there. And we went and we talked to the developers who were responsible for that particular application. We said, hey, we know about this particular vulnerability. This is a big deal. We should get patched. And they said, ah, I don't know. It doesn't really mesh with our release cycle. And I said, no, 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 like, this is a big deal. You guys should patch this. And they said, well, you know, we'll have to talk about it. No, no, no. And lesson for all you security people in the room. Don't be chicken little. Right? If every single issue that you come across is the sky is falling, then the sky is always falling and they're never going to leave you. Right? If you save that cred for the rainy day, in this case, you know, we looked at struts, the exposure and everything, and we said this is our rainy day, right? I, I, that's when you want to use that. And so that was the point where I said, look, I think once before in the 10 years that I've worked at National Instruments, I've said this is a really big deal, we have to do this now. But this is the time, right? We need to fix this guy. And eventually we got the, the people moving in the right direction, and we got it fixed. And then, a couple months later, that's when the Equifax said it's Apache Struts, old version of software, they didn't update it as part of their release cycle, and it resulted in one of the largest breaches in history, right? I think it's uh, over half of all Americans' data were part of that data. So it's very, very important for us to make sure that we're 
looking for these vulnerabilities, that we are keeping track of the software versions that we have out there, we're cataloging that information, and if software gets updated, we need to make sure that we're patching. Impact here, moderate. Um, the system could be completely compromised without you knowing it. All your data could be stolen or modified slowly over time. Recovery costs could be expensive. And after the echo tax breach, I might even say this is more than a moderate impact, right? <laughs> I mean, this is hot. This is very hot for Aquifax. Although, if Target and Teaching Maps and all these other breaches show us anything, Aquifax isn't going out of business, right? Um, I think the, the claim is, well, your data was pretty much public anyway. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so for them, you know, business goes on it mostly as usual, right? They'll, they'll send you a letter in the mail saying, you know, we'll give you free credit monitoring, or in their, their case, it was like a random generator, like enter your information and randomly said, like, yes, you were affected and it weren't. Um, yeah. We, we could do a whole class on, like, uh, what not to do with a data breach, um, and just use Equifax as the example. Um, but yeah, recovery costs here can be really expensive. So it's a big deal. We want to make sure that we're keeping that software up to date, especially if there's a public exposure. So am I vulnerable? Um, so what we want to do is we want to make sure our application uh, is, we, we have a secure hardening process, right? And it, for our entire stack, that means our web servers, our database servers, everything, we want to ask ourselves, is our software up to date? Which means we have to know what version we have across the board. And we have to be monitoring, is there a new version out? The next thing we ask ourselves is, are any unnecessary features enabled or installed? So, not so much anymore. Back in the day, you used to spin up a Linux system, a Unix system. What was enabled by default for system administration? Port 23, Yeah, Clear text. Send your username and password, don't worry about those guys sniffing it over the network, right? Um, so those are the kind of things that we want to look out for. Are there things that are installed by default that we don't need? Are there scripts that are being put out there by default? Um, Apache used to install a bunch of CGI value, a CGI script by default. So we want to look for those kind of things. Um, look at the error handling and say, does our error handling reveal stack traces or other information that users probably should see. You know, maybe it has information about the architectures we're using, the paths we're using, um, maybe there's other information about users or things like that. These are all things we'll talk about later in the information disclosure piece. These are all things that give an attacker additional uh, information that they could use to attack your company. And then the last one here is our security settings in your development framework and libraries not set to secure values. It's interesting that Paul's not strong set, right? This presentation is like, I think Dan and I, this is our fourth time doing it, so it's like at least five years old, probably longer than that. In any case, without a concerted, repeatable application security configuration process, your systems are at higher risk. So let's look at some examples here. Not examples. I should add them into this step, though. They'd be a good example. Um, so the first example here is you have a application server administration <coughs> console, it's automatically installed, it's not removed, and the default accounts are changed. So an attacker could go, it could discover the standard administration pages are on the server, they log in with those default credentials, and they take over. And a lot of people don't realize, but there's websites like defaultpassword.us, where you can just say, hey, what's the default password for this particular application? It says, here you go. Right? In fact, I, I was talking with Dan this a few years ago. Um, I was talking about um, Denim Group had an application called ThreadFix. He was telling me, oh yeah, he's like, I submit the ThreadFix default app and you know, default administrator password into there. Because I don't want people using it, right? I want it to be like, you know, don't use this password. So second scenario, you don't have directory uh, listing enabled on your server. An attacker discovers that they can just list directories to find any files that are in there. They find and download all of your compiled Java classes. They then decompile them, reverse engineer them, and they now see your custom code. 
And if somebody has access to your custom code, then they could potentially find a serious access control flaw in your application and then export that. And there's a, uh, again, on the batch challenge, there's something kind of like that. Uh, third scenario, your application server configuration allows stack traces to be returned to users. Uh, this can potentially expose underlying flaws, and attackers love the extra information that these messages provide. In this case, there's a null reference exception, and it's very difficult to see on there, but there's uh, information about the framework, there's some information about path, and things like that that are on there. Another scenario, uh, your application server comes with sample applications that aren't removed from the production server. Those sample applications have well-known security flaws, and the attackers use them to compromise your server. Now this one is interesting because if you do patching, you might not catch this, right? If there's scripts and things like that that are like sample things that get installed by default, just patching your application might not fix coding vulnerabilities in those scripts. And so it's important for us to recognize this application got installed and it needs to be uninstalled because that's part of our default. Because just upgrading our application might not fix that. Yeah? How many times they get to reinstall the application? Yeah, it's true. Um, so what he was saying is that sometimes when you install the patch, it's almost like a full application you install on top of the application, and those things will be put back. So it's good to have kind of a validation of, you know, is everything in the right place? Have I not installed additional things? And these are tests that we should be doing on an ongoing basis, probably every time we change something in our application, have those types of validation. So how do I prevent security misconfiguration? Well, the primary recommendations are to do all the following. First, we need a repeatable hardening process that makes it fast and easy to deploy another environment that's properly locked down. And so in this case, we should have development, we should have QA, and production, and they should all be configured identically, which means that when we're testing on this environment, when we're doing our QA and things like that, we have identical environments. And that process should be automated to minimize the efforts that are required to set up a new secure environment. So one of the things that we do at NI is we check those environmental configurations into effectively a version control system. And then once they're checked into the versioning system, you basically say this environment pulls from here, it grabs all this, it sets all this stuff up, this is the dev environment, this is the QA, this is the production, and all the data is there. And so if you make a change, you make a change to the versioning control system, and then you push that out live to production. If you guys want to learn, uh, for those of you who are attending the conference, I'm going to be giving a talk, I think it's 10 a.m. on Friday, um, where I'm going to talk about pod security. And this is one of the examples that I talk about in terms of the cloud security architecture that we use with simple risk, in terms of how do we manage this, how do we do this type of automation and ensure that our environments look the same. Number two, we need a process for keeping abreast of and deploying new software updates and patches in a timely manner to each of our environments. And that includes all code libraries as well. It was interesting, I was doing a, a uh, architecture review one time for one of our teams at NI, and at the time they were looking at introducing a new, um, basically, uh, development framework uh, into uh, the company, um, Google Web Toolkit. And they had this you know, presentation, and they had this wireframe uh, application, and they were talking about how great GWT was, and how easy it was to create all this stuff, and they were looking for our architecture team's uh, blessing to basically start writing crap in GWT. And the question that I asked these guys was, all right, now that's cool, it's got a lot of function, features, whatnot. Seems like you guys are able to get up and run very quickly. Who's responsible for supporting that? I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, you're introducing a new architecture, right? We've got this GWT thing that nobody was using before. Who's tracking the version that's installed in production? Who's going to make sure that when GWT comes out with a new version, that's being upgraded in production, in depth, in text, right? And I took that a step further and I said, all right, what versions, what version are you guys using right now? Whatever version they told me, I went and I looked up on the, the GWT website. And I was like, that's two versions ago. 
there were two cross-site scripting uh, vulnerabilities, and there's this vulnerability and this vulnerability, all addressed since then. And we're like, all right, well, I guess we have to find somebody to own that. We have to make sure that somebody's actually tracking that we're using GWT and then get out the mailing list so that we're getting all these updates about every time GWT comes out with a new version and then looking at, actually looking at the updates to make sure that it's not just a function that's coming across but also security vulnerabilities. And if it's a security vulnerability, we have to determine is this something that affects us? How bad is it? Are we using that functionality? Is this app being publicly exposed? Right? And then taking that information and deciding what do we do with this? Is it something where we need to patch today? Because it's a stress vulnerability and that affects us going to lose a lot of uh, data? Or is it something that we can wait on? And maybe it's an internal only application. Not a big deal. Third one, a strong application architecture that provides uh, effective secure separation between components. So we talked about dev, a test, and production environment. How many of you guys have environments where every once in a while you find that dev system is talking a production system? Or maybe vice versa? We had uh, developers who would write a production application. They would hard code this application talks to this database, which happens to be a dev database. Then that gets moved to test. Hey, everything's working fine, no big deal. Then it gets moved to production. Hey, everything's working fine, no big deal. And then the dev database goes down for a refresh. What happens? Production's down, right? Why is production not working? We just did dev refresh. I don't know. Maybe it's because you forgot to update and tell the dev environment or tell the production environment that should be talking to dev. So we should be putting rules in place in our environment to say, hey, Mr. Dev environment, you don't talk to test and production. You talk to dev. And Mr. Test environment, you only talk to the, uh, the test environment. And production, we'll say this is production environment, you only talk to the, the production servers, right? So separation in place. Fourth one here, last one. Consider running scans and doing auth periodically to help detect future misconfigurations or missing patches. And this is where, in the struts case, we're, we were winning, right? And if you listen to the Equifax CEO in front of Congress, where they were losing. The Equifax CEO blamed it all on one person and said it was that one person's job to do vulnerability scanning across our entire environment. And that one person should have told us that that was a vulnerability and should have made everybody else who's responsible for, for fixing that fix it. How many of you guys think it was really one person? <laughs> yeah, right? So this is something that the security team needs to work with the development team, needs to work with the business. You need to know what else is out there. You need to be running scans on a continuous basis. And you need to have a process in place for how do we address these? And how do we rate these? And how do we make sure that the right people are being prioritized to work on these things? Questions? Okay, all right. So the recap here is an attacker accesses default accounts, unused pages, unpatched flaws, unprotected files and directories, and they gain unauthorized access to our knowledge of the system. We've got multiple levels of the application stack that can potentially be affected, everything from the web server, the app server, custom code, whatever. And to prevent it, we need a repeatable hardening process. Check our configurations to GitHub, documentation, checklists, whatever. We need identical configurations about dev, QA, and production. We need an automated secure build process so that we ensure that they're identical. We need a process for tracking software updates, including code libraries that our stuff is built on top of. We need a strong application architecture. And we need periodic scans. We need audits to make sure that we're not missing anything. <coughs> Interesting, uh, I'll give you guys another little side note here. Um, we had a, a, a uh, group uh, at NI that was like, these systems don't need automated patching, right? And the idea with that is somebody else is responsible for patching, but it has to happen like, it can't just be automated driven by IT, it has to like go along with a release or something like that. What happens when nobody realizes they're responsible for patching that system? Systems never get patched, right? So if you're gonna do something like that, 
You're going to create exceptions to your process. Make sure those are documented. Make sure that you have an owner for that process. And then make sure that you're reviewing those things on a regular basis. So this is a risk that's going into Simforce after this conference. And it's going to say um, that we have uh, systems that are basically in this uh, no patching group that are probably being managed. Right? And then we make sure that that's being reviewed on a regular basis to make sure that those systems are still belong there or no. Alright. So number six, sensitive data exposure. This, uh, so a lot of web applications don't properly protect sensitive data. Sensitive data includes credit cards, tax identifiers, uh, bank account numbers, PII, uh, authentication credentials, all these different things. And attackers could potentially steal or modify those weakly protected uh, data to conduct credit card fraud, to conduct identity theft or other types of crimes. And because of this, our sensitive data deserves extra protection, like encryption at rest, encryption in transit, HTTPS, as well as uh, special precautions when it changes with the browser. And the impact here is severe, because if we don't protect our data, then it could be compromised. And if our data is compromised, we can't ensure the confidentiality or the integrity of that data. So typically, this information includes health records, uh, credentials, username and password, uh, personal data, those credit cards, whatnot. And so we need to consider the business value of that false data and the impact to our reputation. Uh, in this case, you know, Equifax is being a, a pretty good skewering uh, with respect to what happened, but they'll survive. Yeah. All right, impact. We also have regulatory and legal issues here. And I mentioned early on when we first started, it feels like you know, it was years ago, um, it was really just this morning, things like HIPAA. If you're not properly protecting health information and you have it in your environment, that's a big deal. And they can actually go and say, you're no longer able to, to be a healthcare provider. They can have severe fines if you're not properly protecting that data. California SB 1386 says that if you lose the data from somebody who's a California resident, then you have to notify them of that. And you have to basically offer them services to protect them against identity. And that's actually becoming a more common law. There's other states that have started adopting that as well. And I would think that that's probably going to be a national law here very soon. Um, PCI is credit cards. And says if you're not properly protecting credit card data, then you can be fined, or they can take away your right to process credit cards. These are big deals, right? So how do we know if we're vulnerable? The first thing you have to determine is which data is sensitive enough to require extra protection. So as an example, passwords, credit card numbers, health records, personal information, those are all probably things that should be protected. And for every type of data that we identify as something that's sensitive or confidential, we do the following. First, is any of this data stored in clear text long term? And then put the backups. We want to make sure that that data is considered to be sensitive, that's being stored in an encrypted format. Second, is any of this data transmitted in clear text, internally or externally? And internet traffic is going to be especially dangerous because if I'm talking to a website and I'm doing it from Starbucks and it's not encrypted, then users are able to sniff that data. Um, there's a great, uh, I think I have an example here, but I'll spoil it for you guys. Um, there was a great program uh, five years ago. It's called Firesheet. It was basically a Firefox plugin. You just load it into your browser, and you'd sit on a Wi Fi network like Starbucks or something like that, and you'd just kick back, drink your latte. And what would happen is, as users on the network were logging into Facebook and Twitter and things like that, Fire Sheep would go and it would grab the credentials off the network. Because at the time, they were uh, not transmitting data in uh, encrypted text. It was all clear text. It was HTTP. And so Fire Sheep just grabbed that information off the network. And it took it a step further and it was like, here's the cookie for this user. Would you like to log in? And you could basically just click the login button and now you're logged in as that user sitting in uh, Starbucks. Right? It's fun if you wanted to troll your friends. 
but as a uh, as somebody who gets stoned by something like that, not so much fun when somebody is you know, trolling on your Facebook page and saying, I got hacked at Starbucks. Third one here, uh, are any old or weak cryptographic algorithms used? Oh, by the way, so that doesn't work anymore. Firesheep is basically dead um, because Facebook got wise. They moved their website to HTTPS only. Twitter got wise, HTTPS only. All these websites that started moving to HTTPS by default. And the result of that is, truths like that don't work anymore. Um, so number three, are any old or weak uh, encryption algorithms used? So, a lot of websites out there, um, you can go to ssllabs.com, um, you can do a website test on there, enter the name of the website, and it'll go up and it'll give you like a, a school grade for how they're doing at SSL, how they're doing at protecting the data. And that ranges from, you know, they're doing an A plus, like they're doing an awesome job, to F. A few months ago, uh, yeah, a few months ago, and I had an app on that. It sucks, right? But the reason why is because we had a bunch of old protocols that were native. We had SSL v2 and SSL v3. These are old versions of SSL. We're talking like Windows XP, right? Where new browsers will still support that. New browsers will actually connect at a TLS 1.2. Um, so we won't even use those. But the fact that we still support those mean that an attacker could potentially downgrade the connection, use one of those things, and get a user data that. There's also uh, weak ciphers. So as an example, triple des, three des, if you're using that as a cipher, um, that's basically obsolete at this point. Um, we should be using better ciphers than that. Um, so in the NI case, we got rid of SSL2, SSL3. I think we still process TLS1 and 1.1. Uh, we, we do default um, preference for TLS 1.2. We do all this work. Now we got an A. <laughs> so, yeah? Um, so the question is, were those protocols in place for backward compatibility? Uh, yes. So the, 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 the answer is, is yes. Um, National Instruments has been around for like 40 years. We had a lot of products that actually interact with the website. And as long as those products were still supported, we had to maintain support for those products, which meant having those protocols in it, right? So you know, you, you have products that literally were created back when Windows XP was a thing, and people actually ran it, and we told customers we would support it. And so the result is, yeah, you had to have them in those places. So as those things fell off, we were able to kind of get rid of those protocols. And now we have better processes in place in terms of how we keep products and things like that updated. That was part of the, the, the issue behind that. Um, number four, are we crypto keys generated or is proper key management or rotation missing? So if you guys are doing encryption in your products or in the application that you're writing, you want to make sure that you're using strong keys, strong crypto algorithms, right? Don't just um, base 64 and code the password and the magic. Don't just pay 64 and encode the passwords, things like that. And we want to make sure that we're properly managing those keys. And not only properly managing those keys, but also making sure that they're getting rotated on a regular basis and things like that. So that I, an attacker is trying to brute force them or things like that, they're not able to do that. Number five, are any browser security directives or heritage missing when sensitive data is provided by or sent to the browser? So there's a lot of different headers that you can provide in your application, and those will tell the browser what they can and can't do. So for example, Dan talked about cross-site scripting earlier. There is a browser directive that you can use that basically says, hey browser, there should be no weird scripts on this page. Go ahead and block them. All right? I think it's XSSS deny, I think is the, the actual header. Um, there's all sorts of different things. There's a X I, I frame options, X frame options that says, hey, Mr. Browser, don't ever put me in an I frame. Right? That prevents things like click jacking attacks. So we want to be looking at these types of things, these types of headers that we could potentially use. And as long as they don't break our application, we should be using them. Because we don't want our applications to fall victim to those types of attacks. 
So here's some examples. The first example is we have an application that encrypts credit card numbers in a database using automatic database encryption. So that means that every time we do an insert, it encrypts the data that's in there. And every time we pull the data out of the database, we do a select statement, that data is decrypted for us. Which is nice, right? The database is doing all this stuff for us. But it also means that's going to decrypt that data automatically when it's retrieved. Which means if there's a SQL injection flaw, like we learned about earlier today, that works based on a select statement. It's going to automatically decrypt the information as we get it. So those credit card numbers, or whatever data we're getting via that um, SQLi attack, are going to be decrypted automatically for us by the database. Right? So what we need to do in this case is our system should have encrypted the credit card numbers using a public key. And then only allow backend applications to decrypt them with the private key. So when we stick the data in, our application grabs the key, and it uses it to encrypt the data, and then it pushes that into the database. And then when some application goes and touches that, we haven't really talked about public-private key pairs. I think that we talked a little bit later on and we get to it. Um, but the whole idea between a public-private key pair is the key that's used to encrypt it is not able to decrypt. You have another key that is only able to decrypt it. Right? And those keys are related, but you can't if you use the, the encrypt key, you can only decrypt it with this one. So your application uses that key to encrypt, and that doesn't give an attacker the ability to see the data, decrypt the data, whatever. And then whatever backend applications are using that credit card data, they have that other key. So you have this kind of like low trust thing over here and the high trust thing over here. Another example scenario, site just doesn't use SSL for all authenticated pages. An attacker just monitors network traffic, like an open wireless network, steals the user session cookie, and then replays that cookie and hijacks the user session, as seen in the data, known as the fire sheet. <clears throat> so that's just a little pictorial. You see the dude looking at the data over the wire. Scenario number three Password data uses, database uses unsalted hashes to store everyone's passwords. File upload flaw allows an attacker to retrieve the password file, and all the unsalted hashes can be exposed with the rainbow table to recalculate hashes. So a rainbow table, for those who don't know, is basically somebody took the time to run a dictionary list, a list of all possible password combinations through the algorithm, whether it's a MD5 or SHA or whatever, they ran it through that algorithm. And they came up, came up with, for this list of words, here's all the possible hashes. And what that means is if you do something like this, if you're able to get the password file, the list of all the hashes, you just take that, look that up in the table here, and say, ah, that hash belongs to this password. It's like going backwards, right? So the way that we protect against this is using what's called assault. And assault is a random value that's stored in the database alongside that user. And when we store a user's password in the database, we're hashing it. We're not storing the actual password. But we're going to hash it along with that salt. So it might look like take the password value, colon, append the salt to it, then hash that value. And then that's the value that you store in the database. And what that means is if somebody grabs that uh, list of passwords or that list of um, of hashes, they don't, they aren't able to just take that, run it through the dictionary list, and come back with here's the here's the right one. Right? They would have to know that password plus the salt combination in order to get to that. And that would require a lot of extra work. Uh, they basically have to recalculate that um, that hash table or that rainbow table for every single salt that's in that database. It's a lot more complicated. This is an example of that. Um, you can go to lots of different websites. In this case, uh, I don't know if I have the website up there. Um, but in this case, I went to one of those sites that had a, a list of all the rainbow tables. You can download it. You can see most of them are in the area of you know, I don't know, 200 gigs or so. And this is the success rate at cracking 
uh, password of that type using that table. So in this case, if you have MD5 hashes, which is still pretty common, although MD5 is supposed to be phased out in the Sean Q at this point, um, and you have alpha space in the numbers one through nine, that's about 24 gig five, or I'm sorry, one, one to nine digits. Um, so if that's all you have, it's a 24 gig file, and you basically have a 100% success rate with that file. Right? All possible less than 10 character combinations of letters and spaces can be had via that one file. And it goes up from there in terms of size and things like that. Um, yeah. Here's the fourth scenario. Now this one has to do with backups. And we said early on, that sensitive data exposure also has to do with backups. Because if you take, let's say, a, a database backup, we back up all of our credit cards and we stick them on a backup tape, and then we put that tape outside and an iron mount comes or grabs those tapes or whatever. If somebody were to grab those backup tapes and walk off with them and they're not encrypted, they now have access to all the data. And this has actually happened over and over again um, with laptops that are left for taxi cabs. It's happened with um, uh, multiple universities where they had student information on uh, backup tapes that went missing and things like that. So make sure if you have sensitive data, not only are you encrypting it on the storage side, and not only are you encrypting it in transit, but you're also considering the other media that are on the top, be it a, another user's hard drive, Doing something like that, or backup tapes, or whatever, flash drives. That kind of thing. Make sense? All right. Um, really good exercise using WebGIP in uh, in secure communication. So, how do we prevent sensitive data exposure? For all of our sensitive data, we want to do the following. First, consider the threats that you plan to protect the data from. Is this an insider attack that we're preventing from? Is it an external user? We want to make sure that we encrypt all sensitive data at rest in transit in a manner that defends against those threats. So if it's insider, and this is, uh, I think this is pretty common to all uh, corporations, large and small, really. How many of you guys are using self-signed SSL certificates? Nobody? We've got a couple, right? a couple of honest people, anyways. Um, a lot of companies are using self-signed certificates. And the result of that is users usually have to click accept in order to accept that certificate. It's not automatically stuck into the browser or stuck into their system the domain policy. And if users are used to just clicking accept, clicking proceed, whatever, <clears throat> to something that's not secure, the end result of that is that they'll probably click accept if there's a man in the middle who uh, basically uses their own self-signed uh, certificate, user clicks accept, and now they see all the data that's there. So, the solution for that is we use uh, CA signed SSL certificates. And by using a CA signed SSL certificate, there's an actual chain of approval, there's a chain of trust in that certificate chain, and that ensures that the user, when they go, they see the lock, you know, nice or whatever to indicate that they are being secure, that the data is secure. Next, don't store sensitive data unnecessarily. PCI actually says, don't ever, ever, ever store the CVP code for this very reason. Most organizations will never need it. You may need the credit card number in order to charge facts and things like that, but you don't really need the CVP code. So as soon as you've processed that transaction, as soon as you've done what you need to do with that information, delete it. Data that you don't have in your environment is data that can't be stolen, all right? So use it for what you need it for, and then you'll never need it again, get rid of it. Same goes for credit card numbers. <clears throat> Oftentimes what people do, they'll take that credit card, they'll charge it, We'll stick in a database thinking, yeah, maybe we might have to refund it or whatever later on. And then they never purge it from the database. And PCI actually says that you have to be purging those data, the data from the database on a regular basis for this very reason. 
you minimize the impact of the data breach if you get rid of that data. Number three, ensure strong standard algorithms, strong keys are used, and proper key management is in place. And the federal government has a standard for this. It's called FIPS 140. And if you look at FIPS, it's going to tell you, here's the NIST approved standards for doing encryption, for doing hashing. Right? And as long as you follow those standards, you should be in a pretty good place when it comes to proper key management and strong algorithms and things like that. Number four, ensure passwords are stored with an algorithm specifically designed for password protection. So I mentioned earlier um, uh, Base64 encoding a password. <clears throat> Base64 encoding is not encryption. Base64 encoding is encoding, right? And what that means is that the same way, the difference there, is when I encode something, I can decode it to get back to its original state, right? When I encrypt something, I'm, or when I hash something, I'm basically going to take a copy of that data, I'm going to run some one-way mathematical function over that data, and I'm going to come up with a completely different piece of data as a result of that. Right? So as a result of that, if I store that, I can validate against that, I can never use that value again. Whereas if I encode something, I can use that value again because it's a two-way function. So decrypt, TBK, DF2, escrow, these are all common routines for doing user authentication. Um, what they will do is they will take those hash functions, and what we found over the years as computers have gotten faster and uh, faster at uh, processing is hashing something once probably isn't enough because then we can create those rainbow tables of just a one you know, MD5 pass or whatever, and we can go and say, there's the result. Right? And if it's twice, it's still pretty easy to go through and hash it twice and then come up with that value. So what these things, decrypt, descrypt, whatnot, are doing is they're actually doing hashing multiple, multiple times. And by hashing it multiple times, you're basically able to say, this particular thing probably is not going to be able to go in a rainbow table because in addition to using our random salt value, we're also doing this multiple hashing, which makes computing that incredibly intensive. Last one here, disable autocomplete on forms um, that collect sensitive data, and disable caching for pages that contain sensitive data. The reason being is there's lots of exploits out there that will allow you to grab that data from caches, allow you to grab that data from um, the, the password storage, the autocomplete features, things like that. And in order to prevent that, we just disable auto. User has to enter the data in order for them to log in with that user and password. Now, like anything with security, there's oftentimes a trade off between security on one hand, usability on the other. And so we have to weigh that and determine which one we want to opt for here. Some high level safeguards here develop a data classification policy if you don't have one. Data classification policy is basically a policy that says, for this type of data, we consider it to be this level, and as a result of that, we either encrypt it, or we don't encrypt it, or we keep data you know, stored in a certain place, or whatever. We review the information stored in an application against that data classification policy, and that's what helps us to determine whether or not it's something that should be encrypted. And then we build or update our application to encrypt those fields when it runs. So here's an example data classification policy. This is one that I had worked on a while back. And we basically classified it into three categories. We have low business impact, moderate, and high. And in the low business impact, these are things like publicly accessible web pages, or product releases, brochures, white papers. These are things that are meant to be public. <clears throat> if it's meant to be public, it doesn't need to be protected. Right? And the result of that is we don't need to do any sort of encryption on that. However, if it's high business impact, these are things like social security numbers, passport numbers, uh, credit card numbers, things like that, health information. If it's one of those things, 
then that's something that absolutely needs to be encouraged. These, these are things that are protected by different laws, different regulations, right? These are, are sensitive information. And then somewhere in the middle, we have this moderate business impact, which are things like eh, your race, your religion, your political leanings, maybe things like your name, your email address, your telephone number. And things like this may or may not be protected by law. They're probably considered sensitive, if not confidential. And so you guys need to make the decision. Probably your business needs to make the decision. Is this something that we want to protect? Meaning we encrypt that data? Or is it something that could be made public? In which case we don't need to. I think most of us would probably lean towards the sensitive, if not confidential side. And the result of that would be we probably would want to encrypt that data. Some safeguards here. So we mentioned strong encryption algorithms. Um, triple DES is being retired. Uh, so we probably shouldn't be using that, we should use AES instead. <clears throat> Don't use MD5 or SHA-1. In fact, if you use a SHA-1 uh, hash uh, SSL certificate today, your browser will give you a warning. And in the coming months, if you continue to use a SHA-1 SSL certificate, your browser will not. Uh, it will tell you that that SSL is insecure and you should not trust that page. That's because that's no longer good. <clears throat> We should all be using SHA-256 now. Use platform provided implementations of the algorithm. Dan made the point earlier. Your, the stuff that's implemented as part of your, your programming language, as part of those libraries, are things that have been vetted. They're things that people have gone over and said, yes, this is good. No, this is not good. Here's why. And patches have been applied for the things that were bad. So if we go and we decide to roll our own crypto, this case, that's probably not good, right? I bet it myself, and I'm a crypto expert. No, you're not, right? So we want to use the, the libraries that are out there, the things that are a default part of the language. We want to use things that have been vetted by other people. And lastly, we want to store keys in a secure manner. Keys are literally like, it, it's like the key to your door lock, right? It's the thing that opens up all the data. And so if you don't store it securely and somebody gets a hold of that, that means that they have access to all of your data. That's not good. Right? We don't want them to have access to the data. So we need to make sure that those keys are stored securely. And that probably means keeping them in a key store or some other form of secure facility. In terms of Java, if you're a Java developer, Java has what's called JCE, or the Java Cryptography Extensions. You can use that for storing those keys. Um, and, and you should. You should use that whenever possible. You can protect the key store then with file permissions, making sure that only the right users can store it. And you use a passphrase for the key store. So what usually has happened is when you start up your application, you'll have to enter the passphrase. And then that passphrase will open up the key store so that the application can utilize that. But if an attacker were to get at that key store, they wouldn't have the password in order to be able to open it and get the data. Make sense? We're all on the same page. Good. Questions? Comments? No. All right. Good teacher. All right. No questions. So to recap here, this occurs when applications don't properly protect sensitive data and can be prevented by encrypting sensitive data at rest and transit don't store sensitive data if you don't need to, and use strong encryption algorithms and keys. Uh, lots of references for OWASP for this one. There's a cryptographic storage cheat sheet. There's a password storage cheat sheet. There's a transportation layer protection cheat sheet. Um, and then there's uh, the OWASP testing guide, which is a really good guide that basically tells you if you were a pen tester, how would you test different things in your application? There's a whole chapter on SSL and TLS testing. So lots of good uh, good references out there, good material and documentation for you guys to take and do some of the stuff on your own. All right, moving on. Number 7010, missing function level access control. Most web applications verify function level access just before making that functionality visible to the UI. However, Applications need to perform the same access control checks on the server 
each time the function is active. So if requests aren't being verified, the attacker would be able to forge requests in order to access functionality that they're not authorized to access. The impact here is going to be moderate. These flaws allow attackers to access unauthorized functionality. Administrative functions are going to be a key target um, because of the, the enhanced permissions as a result of that. And we should always consider the business value of the exposed functions and the data that they process and consider the impact to our reputation if that vulnerability became public. So it probably wouldn't be very good if somebody had additional access to our, our data. So, how do we tell if we're vulnerable? The best way to find out if an application has valid properly restrict functions of access is to verify every application function. And with each of those functions, we ask, does the UI show navigation to unauthorized function? So is the UI showing me that you have access to this thing that you're not supposed to have access to? Secondly, our server-side authentication or authorization is missing. What this means is sometimes we might have some JavaScript that shows or hides certain types of functionality. It's probably okay. But if we're not validated on the back end on the server-side when that post happens, then that's not okay because they can bypass our authorization, bypass our local JavaScript and script, and they can get out of that data. And then the third thing here is our server-side checks done <coughs> that solely rely on information provided by the attacker. So as an example, I might give a user a cookie. Good use of a cookie. No. Um, a, a session cookie, right? And that session cookie, might have a value like admin equals zero, and I store that in a cookie. What's your first thought when I give you a cookie that says admin equals zero? Set it to one. I heard somebody over here, right? Right? Because if it says admin and it's set to zero, zero makes me think false, right? And so if I set it to one, that probably means true. And if I set that value to true, and all of a sudden I'm an admin on the system, that's a bad thing, right? That's bad. So we've now created something that's under control of the user. The user can change that value, can modify that value, whatever, and now they have additional privileges. So anytime we're writing an application, we need to think about, does the user have the ability to modify this? And if you're putting access controls into cookies, you're doing it wrong, right? Now, that doesn't mean that you can't use cookies and you can't use sessions to do this kind of thing. You just need to make sure that you make it a session value that's being accessed by the code, not a cookie value that's accessible by the user. Right? So the session provides the authentication and the authorization. We check uh, in the session that they're supposed to do the things that they're supposed to do. We don't use the cookies to track the values. So, using a proxy, we browse for our application using a privileged role. Then we re revisit restricted pages using a less privileged role. And then we do a diff between those two requests. And we say, do the server responses look the same? And if the diff between them says, there's no difference, I saw the same thing, log in as an admin, that is a non-admin, you got a problem, right? The data should be different. And you can also check the access control and implementation of the code. And you could try following a single privilege request through the code, verify that the authorization happens, and then look through the code base to find where that pattern is not being followed. Is there a spot in the code? If I call every time I'm supposed to check to validate that this user is authorized, you know, there's a function that says, is the user authorized? And then I find some other place over here where I call the code and that doesn't exist then that can be a problem. Now just like the other one, our tools, our automated scanning tools, are probably not likely to find these issues. <laughs> Unless if you have a tool where you can say, here's the authenticated user, here's the unauthenticated user, and tell me the difference, which some of them do, it's not going to be able to do that. Right? Because it's just looking at, hey, I threw a request in, I got a response back. You know, did the does it have a you know, a, a bracket in there because then it's vulnerable across the history. So, so here's an example.
we have an attacker who force browses to target URLs, meaning that they didn't go through some sort of login page or something like that. And the following URLs require authentication. Admin rights are also required for access to the admin get app info. So you've got this get app info page that does not require admin rights. And then you have admin get app info. And if an unauthenticated user can access either page, that's probably a problem because they should have authenticated in order to access either of those. But if an authenticated non-administrative user is now able to access our admin get app info page, that's also a problem. Because that user, while authenticated to the application, does not have admin rights to be able to access the admin page. And that might lead the attacker to more improperly protected admin pages. They can find additional data as a result of that, and change data in the application, things like that. Another example. So a page provides an action parameter. In using that action parameter, you specify the function that's being invoked. So action equals write, or action equals, you know, call this thing, whatever. Different actions require different roles. However, if our application doesn't enforce those roles, that would be a flaw. Right? We want to make sure that if somebody's calling, you know, write to log versus write to admin log, the admin log is being checked and saying, hey, are you an admin? Do you have the access to this particular thing? So how do we prevent this? Your application needs a consistent and easy to analyze authorization model, something that's involved in all of the business functions of your application. So first, think about the process for managing entitlements and ensure that you can update it thoroughly easily. Don't hard code these things. Secondly, the enforcement mechanisms should deny all access by default and require explicit grants to specific roles for access to every function. We see this a lot on like firewall rules and as an example. It starts with the default deny. So assume that this application, that this server, this whatever, cannot do anything. And then go to the next line and say, this is what it can do, right? And if we start everything with the assumption that it can't do anything, then we have to explicitly define what it can do. We start from a much more secure place. Right? It's that least privileged concept that Dan talked about earlier. And if that function is involved in some sort of a workflow, we need to check to make sure that the conditions are in a proper state to allow access. Um, I was talking with a, a friend who used to be a security manager over at Dell. And at one point, he relayed to, the, to me the story about when he first started at Dell, how one of the things he asked was, hey, I want to report of every laptop we've ever sold for less than a dollar, right? And the end result of that is they said, why do you need this? Like, we don't sell laptops for less than a dollar. What are you talking about? <coughs> well, sure enough, we got the report back, and there's thousands of laptops that are sold for less than a dollar. The result of that was there was a flaw in the application, a flaw in the workflow, where it wasn't validating the parameters that were being passed in. It wasn't making sure that those things were happening that had to happen. And so people were ending up able to check out for laptops with less than a dollar and buy their Dell laptops. <clears throat> Another example, there was a, a woman um, who was on Amazon early days. And she went onto the site, say she found a pair of shoes, right? <clears throat> and she went and she clicked on um, checkout. And she entered her credit card information, and she clicked on purchase, and she had that buyer's remorse. Right? She's like, oh my god, I can't spend that kind of money, you know, $100 for a pair of shoes. It would have probably way more expensive than that. But she clicked the close button, right? A few days later, shoes show up in the mail. She's like, oh my god, that's a lot of money. Checks her, uh, her credit card statement, no trouble. What does she do? She's like, all right. Try and get this purse. She goes on, <laughs> online, goes online, looks at the purses, you know, picks out the nice fancy, uh, what's it, Louis Vuitton purse, right? Clicks purchase, sell Louis Vuitton purses on there. Anyway, she finds a nice purse on there, clicks on purchase, enters her credit card number, hits submit, she's 
she goes, all right, this was the point where I closed it before. So she clicks the close button again. It happens. A few days later, package <coughs> arrives, here's your brand new purse, checks the credit card statement, no charge. What does she do next? <laughs> she starts ordering more stuff, right? But so not as to be suspicious or anything, she starts selling things on eBay. <laughs> Why not? It's all free. So she starts going. She orders more stuff, puts clothes at the right spot in the workflow, <clears throat> gets the thing in the mail. She starts selling this stuff on eBay, so she grabs her little uh, um, stamp. And as soon as the, the mailman hands it to her, she slaps a new label on it, hands it right back to him, and he goes off and, and ships it. And so now she's making money off of this. <coughs> well, eventually, Postman gets uh, suspicious as he keeps delivering these packages, which he keeps immediately handing back to him. He reports it, there's a big investigation, she gets caught with this. Right? Uh, I think she paid a fine, but yeah, that part doesn't matter. What matters here is the workflow, right? If we're able to go through a workflow, and each step in the workflow doesn't verify all the previous steps, we've got a problem. If we can get to the point where we're able to make a purchase and have that item shipped to us without actually verifying that we paid our money, that is a big problem. So our applications, as part of this workflow, needs to check and make sure have we satisfied the right conditions to get us to this point? For me to actually send this user a product, have they paid their money? Do we have the right address? Right? We need to make sure we go through these steps. Java specific safeguards. So J2E has built in platform authorization features, and you can configure them in the web.xml file. It also has something called Jazz. Um, JAZA is the Java Authentication Authorization Service, and it can be configured to handle some of this authorization authentication pieces. Questions? All right. So our recap here, this occurs when applications don't perform access control checks on servers when each function is accessed, and can be prevented by providing a consistent and easy analyzed authorization module that's invoked from all of the business functions. Cool. Cool. All right. So um, that ends that. Uh, there's no watch top 10 on uh, failure restricted URL access. Uh, SAPI pieces. OWASP development guide, which is another great guide, by the way. Um, OWASP development guide is basically a guide for developers. We talked about the penetration testing guide, the testing guide. The developer guide is, hey, you're going to write some authorization routine. Maybe you should think about these things. Right? Whereas the testing guide is like, hey, if you want to test for path traversal, here's how you test. Um, so yeah, lots of good stuff there. All right, so before we get started into A8, um, seeing it's about 2.24 right now, uh, let's take, uh, uh, we'll say a 10 minute break. So from now until 2.35, and then we'll come back and we'll get started on this guy. Thank you.